Welcome Caribbean Rhythms. Today is experimental show. First time I have a guest on. He is a crazy uh, Croatian fascist. One of my oldest online friends. Uh, this is not guest-centered show, as you know. This is a BAP show. I come here to do a voice entertainment program weekly. Uh, you know, I never blather just in front of microphone. I write things out ahead, and often uh, there's more than one take. I do this because I've never liked the podcast style. My mind wanders, and I know many of you do like podcasts and the friendly atmosphere of talk between friends, but my show is more a radio voice performance for people who don't really enjoy podcasts. Occasionally, there will be guests on, and I think you will all be interested in Nicolo's takes. Uh, you know him as Fisted by Foucault now on Twitter, but I know him as Nicolo Salo for over 10 years. He's expert international relation. I know many of you are interested in Europe and the European political scene, the electoral status of many European nationalist parties. You know this news station Al Jazeera, cable station, it has demented politic, of course. They actually, they push all the left uh, tranny stuff on the West, even though they're from Qatar. You know, you get lectured by a Qatari news anchor about campus rape in America. How special. But I actually enjoyed watching their news section for a while because they were the only TV uh, news station to show you news from around the world, important events that happen uh, every, that day in Japan or Tanzania or Thailand or wherever with direct footage. When is the uh, last time any news station showed you actually news from around the world? As you know, they no longer even have reporters in any of these places. I think all news now relies on local reporters or, uh, of AFP. Stations like CNN have no local correspondence anymore. They all got fired. They're not news stations. The average reporter knows nothing about the world. Well, Nico, today's guest, is unlike that and very much like the older, high-class journalist instead. He's like the highest class of Al Jazeera journalist. If, uh, well, I don't know if that's a compliment, but I mean to say he knows a lot directly about European political scene firsthand. He knows Italy very well. He knows many politicians in Italy. And I want to talk to him also about Germany elections. But you will notice something peculiar. He has a psychological warfare name right now, fisted by Foucault. Foucault was, I believe, advocate of fisting. You know what uh, this is? It is a, a noble practice invented by modern homosexual cults. You know, that uh, the people, that the media has gotten polite, middle-class, nice wine moms to believe are just a Brady Bunch or normal suburban family, like that budgie character they promote for president. But then I think people would be quite surprised if they knew about the kinds of things Team Cock actually gets up to. You know, some say Donatello, the artist, was a poofter, but you know, what he did uh, with that does not measure up to fisting and the contributions of this movement. Yeah, the gay movement contributions to high life. Like what you see they produced in the 1980s. You know, Foucault worked for the CIA and promoted fisting as a sexual practice and wrote a lot of academic half-baked books that are now cited and believed by your average American professor at large. Isn't that superior to Donatello? Or, you know, that doesn't compare with innovations such as novel parasitic infections you only used to see in pigs and sheep. And, of course, AIDS, something that in a previous age would have disappeared within a few years. It would have been the preserve of the most wretched cults. Let's say it could have appeared and probably did in medieval times but it would have disappeared after it had quickly killed off its uh, practitioners. But in modern world, we like to keep that uh, sort of thing on a simmer and to have it slowly creep into general population in the blood supply. I think maybe next time or some other show, I will talk, however, AIDS denialism conspiracy theory is very entertaining. 
you know, some major people push for this. Uh, they say AIDS does not exist, or at least not in the way you understand it. For example, Peter Duisberg, who is not some lone internet nutcase like me. He's professor of cell biology at uh, UC Berkeley. Or Carrie Mullis, who is, uh, he got the Nobel Prize for inventing the PCR procedure. And many others who are hardly outside the establishment but they say, for example, HIV does not cause AIDS. And then there's another school of thought based in Perth, Australia, uh, that claims HIV isn't even proven to exist. These are the two main schools of AIDS denialism, and of course they conflict. But both come to the conclusion uh, that it is the gay lifestyle as such that leads to a complex of wasting diseases, an immune breakdown, and that this disease, AIDS, has essentially been invented for political reasons. Uh, that Africa, for example, is taking advantage of this to get foreign aid, but that a lot of what gets called AIDS in Africa is actually something else. And this is a, very interesting. There are degrees, by the way, of craziness here that you can accept. In other words, parts of these claims may be true, even if the general one is not. That's the advantage of considering crazy theories. There's an old Mossad line, let the crazy speak. I think this is excellent. I live by this. Because even if a crazy idea is wrong, it brings out certain important facts you then have to face or explain. It helps you find the truth in other ways. But that's a subject for another time. You know, the health blogger Mangan, the carnivory blogger, he used to be a right-wing thinker before, and he talked at times about AIDS denialism. That's how I found out about it. It sounds like a crazy, shocking theory, but I think there's more to it than you first think. Do you really deny, after everything you're seeing now, that authorities will pull a big lie on you? Well, this one may not be that big lie, but it's interesting to consider anyway, and I will do so some other time. For now, in next segment, I will welcome to show Nicolo Salo, to discuss situation in Europe, his strange name, fisted by Foucault, and of course, uh, my sexual superiority to all other men. Because it's possible that I'm the only straight man in the world, and I will prove it one day by sodomizing all of you. <laughs> Caribbean rhythms I have on uh, line, long distance, uh, Croatian fascist lunatic, you know him as by fisted, fisted by Foucault, but I know him as Nicolo Salo, old uh, friend calling in his uh, head, I'm told, four espresso 
calling in from Split, Croatia. Welcome, Nicolo Sala, to Caribbean Reasons. First guest. Hello, Nicolo. Hello, Nicolo. Hello, Bob. First of all, thank you for allowing me the honor and the pleasure of being your first ever guest on this world-breaking and globally important podcast. Uh, secondly, I can't believe that you had two of your female staff fly out here from Rome just to make sure that I'm in the most possible, comfortable setting to record the show. So thank you very much on that. But before we start the program, I was thinking about something today, a scenario that I've wanted to ask you about for little bits now. It's very important because how you answer this question is going to impact what people think about your political opinions on various subjects that are important primarily to Americans, let's say on things like health care or school vouchers. So this is yeah. what I was thinking. Anne Hutchian, well-known podcaster from Red Scare, Bolshevik, Mischling, half Jewish, half Armenian. One night, she knocks on your door, coked out of her head, and she's desperate for your attention. You, out of pity, open the door, allow her in. Now, you have two options. Your first option is to sit her down, humiliate her by playing the entire speech by Josef Goebbels, the famous Total War speech in 1943 at the Berlin Sportspalast. Or yes. the second option, where you put the mask of Ataturk on your face and layer the beating that she not only craves but deserves. Now think about this carefully. How do you answer this question? Uh, yes, I will uh, force her to watch a uh, username on uh, videos, you know, your friend username and uh, roofs of the world, Tibetan esoteric Hitlerism. And I will force her to watch this. I've done this before with many girls. Uh, she will enjoy. She, But I have to tell you, I did meet Anna Kachi and she tried to sit on my face, okay? You know? But I think... Uh, yes, I think... Yes, I think I've, I want to... Tell the audience that uh, Nicolo Salo is a Croatian uh, authoritarian, uh, maybe, something like this, or illiberal, uh, illiberal democrat. I don't know what you'd call it. But he is a strong, uh, believing Catholic. And in the United States, we are faced with something called Catholic integralism, which is a branch of so-called conservatism, they want to take over conservative movement. And these are such people as Vermula, who is a professor, a Harvard professor, who pretends to be a Catholic monarchist, and Ross Douthat at New York Times, and quite a few others, perhaps the First Things magazine. Many of them, uh, especially Vermula, obsessed to, uh, with me, were obsessed with the Bronze Age pervert, attacking me as supposedly a pagan nihilist uh, Nietzschean who is corrupting the youth. And I wanted to ask uh, Nicolo Salo, who is a believing Catholic and who believes in power of the church in politics, I b I'm not sure, I will let him clarify, uh, what he makes of this uh, Catholic integralism in the United States and how it compares to Catholic regimes in Europe, for example, Franco or Salazar before. The first thing that I have to say here, Bap, is that you have only the greatest and finest of enemies, and not just the integralists, the Catholic integralists in the United States, but everywhere, and not just in the sense of politics, but even, let's say, wait staff and restaurants who constantly harass you, but they only do this because they recognize your inherent power. Now, yes, when it comes to integralism in the USA, our Lady of Guadalupe, the idea that if we bring as many Catholics as possible into the borders of the United States, turn them into Americans, we're somehow magically going to transform the United States into a very Catholic political entity. Now, this does sound fantastical, which I'm sure even the most devoted, and you, of course, Catholic integralists will agree. But we as Catholics must believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to transcend all opposing forces. So me speaking as a Catholic is, I like this idea, but there are various problems with this idea. Catholic integralism historically has, of course, been primarily in 
in majority Catholic uh, regimes, states, countries, uh, principalities, etc. The United States is an inherently Protestant co uh, construct. So, you already have this issue whereby even the Catholics in the United States are a sort of watered-down Catholic, protestantized Catholics. So not only do you have the issue of demography with Catholics not being an actual absolute majority, you also have an issue of the lack of Catholicism among Catholics already existing with the United States. There are people who constantly bring up another valid point, the point being that many of these Latin Americans upon whom uh, the integralists pin their hopes to Catholicize the United States are really not Catholic syncretists who believe in Santa Muerte or have already converted to Protestant evangelicalism. And those that are showing up will eventually turn into evangelicals. So these are all enormous hurdles that make the idea uh, and, and the ability to swallow the arguments in favor of Catholic integralism all that much more difficult. Yes. Yes, uh, they had uh, some opportunity, I think, to impose Catholicism in South America, but uh, without much success, even with uh, dictators or very strong executives, such as many South American states have uh, right now still. So I don't know how they hope to have Catholic regime in America when we see with Trump the executive actually is not very strong. Uh, the, I'm going to talk I'm over you right now and show you some disrespect and continue because you brought up a very good point. In Latin America... Christianity, is, and especially Catholicism, is very tied into the poor. We saw that with liberation theology. And this is an off-branch of Marxism. So if you have these types of Catholics coming into the United States, they're also violating the, the probably the most important ethos of the USA itself. The business of America is business. This is why the powers that be in the United States would never let a Bernie Sanders win. Why would they let not just a Bernie Sanders win, but let's say a bunch of faithful, fanatical, socialist Catholics come close to any power in the USA? I don't see that as, 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 as feasible. Yes, I uh, also must be emphasized as uh, Franco is probably what people think about when they think Catholic dictator. And to some extent, Salazar, although he was not really Catholic dictatorship, why, how would it look in the United States? I, it's very strange to me, even what these uh, integralists are proposing, let's say Vermeula or Dowsett, does not sound to me anything like what I know historically to be Catholic dictatorship or Catholic regime. They seem rather concerned with this interpretation of Imago Dei, made in the image of God, this line from Genesis, which I believe they interpret in a way that Christians did not interpret for 2,000 years. And they twist that essentially to mean the program of open borders of the USA elite. And they put a kind of Catholic face on it. This is my view of what they're doing. What do you make of that? Why does it look nothing like what Franco was doing? Or like we were talking before about Charles Morat and Action Francaise from France, the Catholic fascist so-called uh, program. Can you comment on that? Of course I can comment on that. Here is a classic quote from the Spanish War, the most impo important conflict from an ideological perspective in the entire 20th century. During the Spanish Civil War, various factions divided into two main groupings, the Republicans, who consisted of everything from liberal Democrats, uh, let's say small businessmen, all the way through to anarchists, Trotskyites, communists. On the other side, you had the rebels, who were the nationalists. These were composed of various groups as well, ranging from royalists to integralists who are subsumed by the royalists, to open fascists like the Falange, to military men, that the grouping that Franco com, uh, came from. The famous quote about the Spanish war, war, and this is important to understand, is, I forget who said it, but he said, even the communists in Spain are Catholic. 
This is very important because what it shows is that even though you had fanatical groupings that were digging up nuns, digging up priests, digging up their corpses just to parade them around and to desecrate them or sometimes desecrate them for a second or third time, these same people, their entire worldview was so informed by Catholicism that even as they went over to Marxism or to Bakunin and Proudhon and their various forms of anarchism, they still saw everything through Catholic filters, through Catholic lenses. That is is not the same in the United States where you have a Protestant based around ideas of individual liberty that informs not only culture but economics and politics as a whole. So it's a case of trying to push a round peg into a square hole. It's not a proper fit. Yes. But do you believe, as I have said, that these so-called Catholic integralists in the United States are in fact liars, that they are not genuine Catholic integralists, that they themselves are promoting a kind of liberation theology, and in fact fully the program of the globalist elite, just with a Catholic face, with some Catholic aesthetics. Would you disagree with that? You're asking a question about intentions, and I don't think I can answer that question, because it means to peer, to peer into the soul of individual people. I am not BAP. I don't have the power that you have to do that. Do that. At the same time, there's also careful. a question of pragmatism versus being principled. And let's say some of these people are principled and sincere in their object about, about Catholic integralism in the United States. There also might be those that are sincere that seek to approach it pragmatically, whereby they don't touch certain rails that should not be touched in U.S. politics because it automatically disqualifies you from the discourse and from respectable community. Yes, I see, I understand. But let's move to more uh, interesting matter now regarding uh, Catholic integralism. Uh, would you care to comment on this French organization, Action Francaise, and on its founder, Charles Morat? You said you read recently article on this in Catholic magazine first things. Fantastic uh, would article. Do you have anything to say about that? Fantastic article that popped up a few days ago in First Things magazine by Nathan Punkowski called The Revenge of Mora. I urge everybody to read this, and I've posted it all over the place, whether at Salah Forum, which we'll discuss later, and of course on my Twitter feed, and I've exerted it. Thanks. Charles Mora who was a very gifted and talented writer, a polemicist, huge influence on French politics, born in the mid-19th century, died shortly before World War II. He was ag an agnostic at first, and an agnostic for a long time, and some of his writings actually got him into a lot of trouble with the church. The Vatican actually banned his writings, I think, for a period of 16 years. The ban was lifted in 1939. But Morat was, in essence, an anti-Republican. What this meant was that he was opposed to all forms of republicanism because he felt that not only did it go against the nation, but it went against God. And he had a lot of foresight, and I think I, he, I, he is regaining currency, regaining popularity, because a lot of his writing stemmed from the fact that he saw republicanism represented by various cameral bodies, parliaments, all this, as pitting the people against their own people, thereby dividing the nation. This is very important when we discuss Poland and Hungary in a bit. His proposal was to scrap all of this in the name of national unity, whereby opposing groups would rally around a figure, and his figure was a monarch. Now, I'm not necessarily a monarchist, but his argument is the argument for monarchy that makes the most sense to me, whereby you take the symbolic face of the state away from various bodies that are easily amenable and put it onto the face of a monarch, right into higher power, higher power, that being. Yes, I understand. I think that uh, the New World Order trying to interfere with our connection and there are some duplicated phrases on your end. Uh, would you care to repeat just the very last phrase of what you said? The very last phrase, okay. Uh, Mora 
just regarding the monarchy. Yeah. Okay, Morat came to the conclusion that monarchy was the best solution in respect to how to arrange society because because he felt that camera, bicameral bodies, parties, all of that, all of that only helped to entrench the division between the various peoples that constitute a nation. By rallying around a monarch, you were rallying around the nation, and the monarch could not be an indivi a divisible figure himself because he himself was indivisible as a single as a single entity. Yes. Yes, I think uh, we should uh, end this first segment uh, on this note. And I will add, uh, last week I discussed the uh, leftist takeover of South America in context of Argentinian elections. And it's worth it to note that during the military dictatorship in Argentina in the late 1970s, there were quite a few Frenchmen involved in those military operations against Marxist terrorism. And they had come directly from Action Francaise, including a uh, theologian, I think his name is Jean Ousset, who made a theory about opposing worldwide Marxism. And the dictatorship, in part, tried to put into action his idea, which was to eliminate the social base of leftism. They tried to do this, even by having military operations against universities that were strongholds of Marxism in Argentina. It ended up not working, perhaps for other reasons, not having to do with this. But it's important for people to understand this and let me, let me interject a point here, here Bappi. Uh, let me interject a point yes. here, Bappi, is that yes. one of the reasons why I'm very much an admirer of Jose, uh, Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, the leader of the Spanish Falange, is he sought to co-opt the left in a, let's say, a proto-form of Nazbalism, even though he was opposed to communism and even though he was, himself was not a Nazi, he recognized that the major sticking point with a lot of the left in pre-Civil War Spain was the grinding poverty of the masses of the campesinos, the poor farmers who did not have their own land. His solution, which was part of national syndicalism, by which was the way to get rid of all these internal divisions within a nation for the sake of national unity, was to win concessions from the various landowners to help these people yeah. be able to get their own plots of land, thereby winning them over to their side of the political divide. So this is something to keep in mind, that if you have an opponent such as the social left, which you've mentioned just now, there are ways to divide them that are not going to necessarily impact or completely harm your own side. Yes, important, yes, important to note. I was just saying uh, this about Argentina to make that this organization, Action Francaise, is not just some obscure think tank. They had important worldwide representatives active during the Cold War in all kinds of theaters. People uh, should know well, this. Well, one of the fun facts, and people are going to find this funny, is that Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, he actually flirted with Axes back in the time of World War II. He was very much anti-Anglo time, and, and he had a brief flirtation with uh, the groupings that were present out there in Quebec. So yes, you're right, this wasn't limited just to France. This was actually uh, a phenomenon in the entire Francophone sphere, as well as in Latin America. Yes, very good. Let us take break, and now we next we move to discussion of uh, Europe, uh, European electoral politic, and the Visegrad group. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, yes, hello. We are uh, back on show with uh, Nicolo Salo, uh, amazing worldwide Croatian nationalist. Uh, hello, Nicolo. Welcome back to show. Welcome back from Bay. Hello, Bap. Yes. Um, before we dive into the rest of the things that we were going to discuss, people have, of course, been asking me information about you. I've yes. put a very tight lid on this for the sake of OPSEC. OPSEC is very important to a man like yourself, a man as important, as vital, and as powerful as yourself. But yes, sometimes public service is necessary. And I would like to inform everybody that because your show has finally hit the magic number of 500,000 subscribers, that I can reveal that I have pinpointed the location of the funding, the secret funding behind this podcast to either one of two places in Argentina, either Rosario or Cordoba. And yes. that these funders are most likely older German men. Can you can you answer this? Can you speak to this? Uh, yes, uh, it's true. They are a German uh, pervert and uh, outside of Cordoba, many people don't know, is in center of Argentina, dead center, I think is where Che Guevara was from. But there is a place there called uh, Capicha del Monte. It's a small city, small town in the mountains. Uh, big site, center of UFO sightings, UFO center. And this is uh, not coincidence. I have spent uh, much time there, and I want to also inform audience that there is big tradition in that part of Cone of South America. You go to South Brazil, there used to be governors in the 1980s who had complete absolute authority over their own province, and they built UFO runways. And UFO cults are very big in that part of Cone of South America. I believe in this kind of federalism. You know, Kirsan Ilyumzhinov in Russia, he make chess palace in the Kalmyk Republic of Russia, Putin lets him, uh, gives him complete free hand to do what he wants. He rules it like a medieval fief, this uh, governor of this small Russian republic, Kalmykia. And he built there a huge chess palace, and he puts, and he puts chess in schools. He's obsessed with chess. But, but was Bobby Fischer ever there? I am not sure, but this man, Kirsan Ilyumzhinov, he bought out, he became president of World Chess Federation, simply because Putin gives him complete power to do what he wants in his own domain. And this is a version of federalism, I believe in. Anyway, you are right. In uh, Argentina, there are these local traditions and uh, local German barons. They, they have been funding me for... Uh, but uh, let's tell this audience how uh, we met. I, uh, Nicolo Salo is old friend of mine, one of my oldest online friends. We must have met more than 10 years ago, must be 11 years. And uh, then you made this forum called Salo. Uh, you made it because uh, we kept getting banned or I kept getting banned from uh, even very far right uh, forums or free speech forums like Zephora. They kept banning me. They could not they could not take Bronze Age perversion. So uh, Nicolo Salo made this special forum for a niche of a niche of a corner of the Internet. Back in 2007, you, in your pre-Bronze Age perverts incarnation, which was Hyperion, I'm sorry to have yeah. to let the cat out of the bag about that, but you popped up on a place called the Fora, which is still in existence. A lot of good people there, but also a lot of shitty quality people there. Now, what endeared you to me was that upon our first encounter in a chat box room, you were under attack from all sides. And usually when a person is under attack from all sides, they're seeking allies from whoever they can get just for the sake of numbers. So when I entered the conference and said, hello, you asked me how big my dick is. And I thought, okay, I don't this is an this interesting is a lie. Guy. This is a complete lie. Now, yeah, is... after both of us getting banned from there, repeatedly brought back, etc., you more so than I, I decided to set up Salo Forum, which is going to celebrate its ninth anniversary on the 29th of this month. A niche of a niche of a niche, as you say, for people who simply couldn't be tolerated even on the most far right of far right forums. 
uh, usually due to the fact that we come across as a bit more foreign. But a lot of the favorite online people on our side of the internet have come out of this little tiny forum. Yourself, the bureaucrat came out of there, the famous Hakan, the scientist, the racial scientist, he was there for a while, Posidonus, yes. and other people that uh, people have only heard of, people like Thomas 777, and of course the amazing Valencian Cornelio from Spain. So yes. we spent years and years and years on this <coughs> site, salo-forum.com. You're all welcome to join us, by the way, and please do. To engage in our political autism, which we've refined to such a point that people actually listen to the shit that we talk about and take it seriously. Yes, we were pariahs. Uh, many of us pariahs of internet. I got banned from basically every forum that uh, I've ever been part of. Every internet forum, including so-called bodybuilding misc forum, that banned me for quote-unquote threatening, sending threatening DMs. And uh, then, of course, Rush banned me from his forum. And uh, we have no place to go. Uh, we were the original, uh, we were chased for our freedom of speech, our freedom of thought. In many ways, we are heroes. Yes. So uh, let's tell audience, you know, then I uh, met uh, Nick in person. We, I visited him in Croatia in, uh, when was that? Two, two years ago, before a, a bad book came up, before I wrote my book. And uh, we met in... Uh, Croatia, what do you have to tell the audience about this, about me? So, yes, so BAP, and the curiosity with BAP all the time was, is he the actual product that he pushes online to all these impressionable youths? And without joking about it, he actually is. He is not a fat slob as some hope that he actually would be. The man is in, is in serious shape. He is not six foot three, the height of gods, so that is a strike against him. But the man is a beast, and not only is a be a beast, but he projects himself as a beast. On the island of Brach one day, he said, Nick, I need to go do my cable exercises. And I said, sure, let's go do some cable exercises. So we found a populated spot on the beach. He had his short, short, tight, short shorts on, began to do his cable exercises, and he started to intimidate all the Swedish men who were on vacation with their Asian wives. And he said, look how intimidated they are. And I noted how intimidated they were. Yes, you mentioned height. It's uh, supposed to tell people that um, the area where Nicola comes from, the Dalmatian Alps, the Dinaric Alps, is the tallest man in the world. These are a combination of Croatians, uh, Montenegrins, Bosnians from that area. And Nicolo himself is a very giant man. I heard that if you do not reach six feet tall by the age of 18, if you're on uh, Dinaric Alps, your father kills you. Is this true? Yes, uh, he's giving a warning at 16 that if he doesn't grow up uh, to the proper height within the next two years, he will be killed. Usually what happens is, though, some places have unfortunately liberalized where they only beat the shit out of their sons and walk them in shame out of the village. It, it's a horrible development, but modernity somehow seeps in everywhere. Uh, yes, and uh, you will uh, admit right now on air, uh, right now live before the audience, that uh, I am the most uh, handsome man that you've ever met, yes? You are the most handsome man and the most sexually powerful man that I've ever yes. met. But yes, uh, I did psychologically dominate you while you were here in Dalmatia. Uh, well, some may disagree, but first, it, it, any new people at Salo Forum have to concede uh, my sexual superiority, only new members. This is part of the uh, rules there. But you say you psychologically dominated me. I would uh, beg to differ, and I want to remind you that uh, my mother visited us, and you tried to talk to her politics, and uh, she just shut you down. She would not have you uh, lecture her, okay? She th and she thinks you're a gypsy. Your mother shut me down. I'll have to concede the point. Yes, you, you know. 
Uh, well, anyway, so, uh, yes, uh, Nicolo, we should talk now about uh, electoral uh, situation in Europe. We talk and, about uh, your capitano, Hungary. Matteo Salvini. Yes, uh, we are back from show. We had to take an uh, emergency break. My glycine ran out, and uh, Nicolo, of course, is getting shit-faced drunk on Schlivovitz, which is the drink for uh, pre... It's the perfect drink if you want to take prior to ethnic pogrom. You drink this swill made from distilled apricots or plums. I don't know. It's one of these Slavic ape drinks. I don't understand it. But, uh, Nicola, welcome back. Uh, we are back to show, and I want to ask you now about uh, European regional electoral elections and the condition of nationalism in Europe. Uh, where should we start? You know a lot about Italy, about Salvini. You know, you know him personally, or something like this. Everyone knows how much I love Il Capitano Matteo Salvini, the captain, and he's a very popular figure, not only in Italy, across Europe and even in North America. He is a man that exudes charm, and he is a very intelligent and politically savvy operator at the same time. Now, what we must understand about Matteo Salvini is that he is a product of his origins. His origins being in Milan, he's a, he's a Lombard, he's a Northern Italian. People, though, are unaware that it was him that pushed the program to expand Lega Nord, the Northern League, the party that was set up initially for to pursue greater autonomy for Northern Italy to the point of a secession where they would call their own country Padania. Matteo Salvini said, uh-uh, don't like that. We are going to go for an all-Italy solution. So he is to be credited for that. He's also to be credited as a very loyal man because never did he let slip that he was going to pursue this while he was not in command of the party. He bided his time, he waited, and then he seized power, and then he moved the party to this position, and it has reflected in a wild level of popularity for the party where they're now polling consistently over 32 33 percent and that's a conservative estimate they are now waiting in the wings to take power come the next election matteo salvini who has probably the greatest social media presence of any politician on the internet trump is nowhere near him trump is the master of twitter everyone has to give that to him but what salvini salvini does across many platforms no one can touch him uh, he has created such a, a a unique blend of man of the people as well as being a nationalist uh, where he is not uh, out of touch or not coming across as an elitist himself. So the situation in Italy now, to bring everyone up to speed, is that Matteo Salvini and Lega, he changed the name from Lega North to Lega to make sure that it encompasses all of Italy, as previously mentioned, is they were in power up until a few months ago when Salvini's party started getting pressure from its own grassroots to make a play for a move. They were not happy with some of the actions of their coalition partner, M5S, 
also a populist party, not necessarily ideological, but more anti-elitist, with people from both the right, the center, uh, the left, and of course the center as well. They were not happy that M5S, Five Star Movement, their coalition partner, was opposing moves towards a flat tax. Salvini has not only staked his claim on restricting immigration, which he did a great job of as interior minister, uh, we have all the stats showing how few new arrivals were accepted onto Italian soil, but also in reforming the economy, whereby it would not be a simple transfer of wealth to the rich, but rather uh, a cut across the border tax is a flat tax that he got inspiration from, from Viktor Orban in Hungary, who has himself uh, and his people seen great success with that flat tax solution. M5S was not exactly too excited about that. So Salvini was urged into making a play, which was his probably first false step. The coalition fell apart and the former communist, now Social Democratic Party, one of the two biggest parties in post-war Italy, came in to fill the vacuum, formed a coalition with Five Star, and Salvini now is the main man in opposition. He is just waiting for his moment to strike, teasing the government to call an election. Everyone knows that the governing coalition is not very popular, it's tottering, it's very fragile, but they themselves know the second they call an election, they're in they're in real deep shit. Yes, I see. Uh, I hope uh, you are right, because I was very disappointed in uh, what he did when he got himself out of power. The, I do not think there was 4D chess. I think he made a mistake. And uh, we will see. Uh, all of Europe may end up paying for his mistake. But on the other hand, what if the current technocratic parties end up stopping immigration themselves through some other channel. I don't know. But you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned, well, we can get to that in a second, but you mentioned that he took uh, inspiration from Orban. So I, perhaps you would care to comment on uh, recent uh, developments with Hungary and Poland. Yes, I'll tie this all in together. Salvini, while he was interior minister a few months ago, actually had meetings with Orban, publicized. I posted a lot uh, about that. Great pictures, everything. And they actually engaged in public displays of unity. The reason for this is that Orban, Hungary, a country of a little over 10 million people, does not have the weight of Italy, who has the third strongest economy in the EU. They actually have a larger economy than England when you factor in the gray economy and the black economy. So Hungary, of course, has to seek out partners. It has a partner in Poland and it had a partner in Salvini. So all of us are disappointed that Salvini is out of government, Lega's out of government, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that he was the junior partner in that government. So there is a longer game here at play, even though tactically he did lose by being forced out of government. Now, going over to Hungary, this is the most important question in Europe today. Is Europe going to be a federal super state whereby countries are no longer countries, but basically branch offices of Brussels? Or is Europe going to be a community of sovereign nations? Community of sovereign nations is a phrase, a term that's gaining currency in large parts of Europe. Our Ben has said it himself. So have the Poles, so have the Slovaks, so have the Slovenes, and so, so has Salvini and others in Italy. The desire to create an EU superstate is still there. Macron is making moves in this direction. The Germans have stopped for now because of the weakness of their position and because Merkel's party, the CDU, has been taking a beating in Germany, which I'll speak about in a second. But to make people understand is that there's a lot of people, especially online, uh, especially on the right, who have a knee-jerk reaction against the European Union. And this is not necessarily a positive. The knee-jerk reaction against the European Union as a whole is probably what cost Marine Le Pen a good five, six, seven percentage points in the French election, which she herself has admitted in her loss to Macron. The EU is very popular among Europeans. Immigration is not popular. 
but immigration is not everything the EU is about. At the same time, we need to separate what the EU is and what the Eurozone is. The Eurozone comprises only those countries that have the Euro as their currency, countries like Italy, countries like Germany, countries like France, and you have those that are outside, countries like Poland, for example. So everyone needs to understand that. The battle is no longer between countries that want to get out and countries that want to stay in. The battle now is what form is the EU going to take? Now, the EU accuses these countries, Hungary and Poland in particular, of being illiberal democracies. I actually wrote a piece about this a little over a year ago, I think it was, in Jacobite magazine run by Robert Mariani and those guys. And it got a lot of positive feedback, so I'm very happy about it. But one person, one person who raised the point about titling of that was uh, a guy who criticized actually your presence in the American mind, Michael Brendan Doherty from NRO, National Review Online. And he said, he sent me a DM, he said, but I don't really think they're liberal democracies. And he was right. They're not liberal democracies. The issue yeah. here is that the term democracy has been monopolized by assholes in Brussels who have ever narrowing definitions to the point where you can unright, outright win majorities like Orban still have all the trappings of democracy, all the necessary conditions, uh, open elections, media, courts, etc., blah, 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 and still be deemed a non-democrat. So that right now is the main battle in Europe. Yes, I understand. Uh, you mentioned uh, your writing, and I understand you're putting together a compilation of essays, all the new. Is this correct? Is a new book you're writing? This is correct. Taking inspiration from other hustlers and grifters and ebook merchants, and because of psychological pressure that I've put on myself uh, from swallowing and absorbing all this media because we're all online addicts, I need to somehow vomit all this out. And if I'm going to vomit all this out, I got to make sure that it's a decent product. And the avenue that I've chosen is an ebook format, whereby Nicolo Salo will be an ebook merchant. It's a compendium of essays, tentatively titled Fisted by Foucault, which will be covering not just politics, but also culture and history. There's going to be a little bit of it, of everything for everyone. So I think people are, are really going to find something that they'll like in at least one or two of the proposed eight essays that I have in there. It won't be entirely European focused either. We're going to talk about California. We're going to talk about some of the crazy shit that went down there in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, bookmarked by the free speech movement at Berkeley, the hippies at Haight-Ashbury, all the way through all the random freeway killings of the 70s, Manson, that type of stuff. And of course, a subject that has gotten a lot of play uh, on my side of the internet, especially, is the early days of HIV in San Francisco. Yes, very interesting subject. And I had a prelude before our recording uh, just about this, uh, this matter. Let's get to that in a second. Uh, which, uh, I very much look forward to your book, encourage you to put it out as soon as possible. And uh, we all look forward to reading uh, Nicolo's book. But uh, I want to ask you some more about this uh, European situation. So you are saying these countries, uh, mainly Eastern Europe, they are called, some of them, Visegrad Group. I believe it's Poland, the former Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, which you are saying will draw Europe back to more a confederation and not so much a super state. Uh, this is uh, what you're saying. And the uh, second part of my question is, uh, what do you have to say about the fact that it is these countries in particular, and you may add to it Croatia, uh, Slovenia, uh, Austria, uh, these countries are the ex-territory of the ex-Habsburg Empire. And I had an episode about this uh, two, two shows ago, I think. Do you have any comments on why it is precisely these countries that are moving Europe in this other direction than the superstate Brussels one? There's a very good answer to that. Uh, there's been a slew of articles this past week in mainstream media, The Guardian being my favorite outlet to not only to reference and source, but to shit on, about the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
And there has been some soul searching from centrist, moderates, leftists, and they have finally realized that their interpretation of these events was wrong. Their interpretation of why 1989 happened was that people were yearning for individual freedoms that they did not have under the former communist bloc, under the former Soviet Union as well. This was only part of the story. Coca-Cola, Levi's, uh, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Elvis, that was part of the story. And those are all important aspects of it. I like to always say that there was four cultural ICBMs that the West deployed against the former Eastern Bloc. And I mentioned a few of them. Coca-Cola, Levi's Jeans, Elvis Presley, meaning all popular modern music, and of course, Looney Tunes. People in the communist countries went crazy for this. But... The individual freedoms were only part of it. What they left out was that these were national and nationalist reactions against foreign domination. So these countries became free somehow, all of a sudden, out of the blue, and they had time to pursue their own past when it was interrupted due to World War II and due to Soviet occupation. Since then, the European scene has changed. There's a lot of things that these countries looked at at first jealously and then realized, you know what, we're not that crazy about this. Here's a perfect example. About a year ago, there was an article in the UK Daily Telegraph about Polish immigrants. Since the end of the Cold War, some 2 million, I think, close to, I don't know, I'm not sure the exact number, Poles emigrated to the UK to work jobs there. And the writer was stating how the intention, one one of the reasons why they did this was as a a bit of a a cultural tactic, was so that these Poles would call home and say, you guys don't know how great this country is, how great this society is. We should be copying this back in Poland. But the writer said, you know what's happening? A lot of these Poles are going home and saying, My God, you don't want what they have. It's a fucking disaster out there. And I've seen evidence of this. Up on YouTube, you have these young Polish guys in various locales all around the UK. They will put up videos that they film on a Friday or Saturday night showing how bad the situation is in some of those cities, whether it be with domestic youth, whether it be with uh, with Western, uh, with West Indies gangs, uh, the Jamaicans and things like that, and how they act on a, on a typical night out. And these YouTube uh, channels are very popular in Poland. People who were supposed to fall in love with the West, with their concepts of individual freedom, with, uh, with the free market and all that, have said, you know what, fuck that, you don't want that. They go home on vacation, they visit their family, some have returned to stay for, for uh, uh, permanently, and they tell everybody, uh-uh, let's not copy that. Yes, this is uh, very interesting because this phrase, illiberal democracy, I think you're right, is ridiculous. In other words, these countries, they guarantee property rights, they have free speech rights, they have all the traditional trappings of what used to be called liberal democracy. And I think Brussels and such simply calls them illiberal because they want to reject precisely the elements you just named. They don't want Jamaican gangs running wild on their streets. They don't want their daughters and sons learning how to put a cucumber in their ass in school. And because they reject this, they're called illiberals. If you do not want to put a cucumber in your ass in school, you're a Nazi. And Central Europe has said no. Central Europe has finally gotten its independence. They want to pursue their own national inspirations within the EU structure itself. They understand they cannot be completely sovereign, but at the same time, they're not going to open their doors to 5 million people uh Ibos or Yoruba or Pashtunis, so that they come in their country and completely destabilize something that they finally set in place uh, for themselves. Yes, now, Nicolo, I remember uh, you had very interesting discussion one time about the attempts to subvert these democracies, especially through Soros uh, associations and this, this fraud phrase, civil society. And these countries, Hungary, Poland, are said to uh, stop civil society or to restrict it. And of course, what's uh, meant by that is they don't want these fake NGOs funded by foreign uh, sources, usually Soros, 
working with local media, usually to create uh, trouble, to create so-called color revolutions. And you had a whole explanation once, I remember. I don't know if you remember uh, this particular about how the media cycle, the f- a fake media cycle is created in these countries. I don't know if you want to okay. comment I on will, that. I would be happy to explain this because I've been tracking Soros for over 20 years now, since I was a very young guy. Why? Because his first two targets for regime change were Slovakia under Mečiar and, of course, my own country, Croatia, under President Tudjman. He developed this program, which is it's brilliant, whereby you use NGOs who partner up with the U.S. State Department uh, to influence media, to buy media, and to dominate media in these countries. Now, the way it works is like this. You set up all these so-called independent media centers in these countries. You find whatever journalists are affordable, and they're all very affordable here in this part of the world because they don't get paid much. They're not getting paid much as, uh, that much uh, in the USA as well now these days, but they're getting paid a pittance over here. And you find these kids coming out of university. Some of them have been brainwashed by whatever indoctrination that, that, that is the passing fad right now. But they would open up these independent media centers – They would write the worst shit about these countries, all based on freedom, this, blah, 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 that, um, civil society, and this. And what they would do then is they would always have these exact same journalists who have no uh, standing or popularity in these countries being the most relied upon resources in Western media, whether it be in Germany or whether it be in the UK or in Canada or in the USA. So you would create this closed loop whereby the people talking are the people who are criticizing. So you would get a distorted picture of this country. Now, what makes it even worse is when you have these arms of the U.S. government, let's say like Freedom House. You're aware of who Freedom House is. Freedom House issues a report card every year about how free, and I'm using parentheses here, uh, my fingers are in the air, how free each of these countries are. They rely on these same NGOs, these same uh, bullshit independent media outlets to be able to grade these countries and to pass these grades. And what does group, what do groups like Freedom House do? They're the ones that inform congressional committees in the United States, especially the Foreign Policy Committee, uh, on how to pursue foreign policy. So it's an indefinite closed loop whereby Soros funds it, he populates it, he staffs it, and they're all on the same message. These people do not represent more than, let's say, 10, 15 percent, I'm being generous here, of what people are thinking in these countries. But the picture is so distorted that when you read about these countries in the West, you think that these are the mainstream people, these are the top journalists, et cetera, et cetera, when they're not. They're the rejects. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very bad situation, and I'm afraid one of Trump's failures has been to uh, completely not correct this. Roger Stone was remarking uh, a year or two ago how the embassies in uh, Romania, Bucharest, and uh, Hungary, Budapest, are completely Soros-controlled. Uh, they are basically Soros franchises, these U.S. embassies. Uh, this is how uh, the state works in uh, these parts of the world. and. I wanted to move from this to the question of Germany, because they call these countries unfree in East Europe. But in these countries, you can pretty much say what you want on either side, and your life is not destroyed. Whereas in Germany, you can easily have been raided by the police and go to jail for thought crime, for speech crime. And I've heard... Uh, I've heard a statistic that right now in Germany, there are more political prisoners sent to jails than there were during communism in East Germany. Uh, I've heard this statistic because you can get sent to jail for so-called Holocaust denial, but it, people misunderstand. Holocaust denial in Germany doesn't mean a neo-Nazi saying, I believe it never happened and I think we should kill the Jews or something like this. It's just if you question one small part of it or even if you don't uh, show complete allegiance to the main narrative, you can go to jail. But that aside, would you care to comment? You mentioned Germany. Would you care to comment on the recent elections there and uh, the relationship of this European situation to electoral situation in Germany? Germany is the most important country in Europe. That's a truism that is actually true. And 
it is now in a very interesting position for the fact that in the former DDR, the former Eastern Germany, you have the collapse of the mainstream ruling parties. Last weekend in Thuringia, you had Merkel's CDU come in third place. Die Linke, the successor party to the former East German Communist Party, won the election. AfD, the German nationalists, or as the media would term it, the hard right, the far right, came in second. The majority of votes cast were cast for those two first two parties for non-mainstream parties, non-elite parties, meaning that these are parties of the far left and the far right. This is a situation that many people would refer to as Weimar, and ironically enough, Weimar is located in Thuringia. The difference, of course, is that Germany in during the Great Depression and prior to Hitler, was a very sovereign country. Right now, it's not necessarily a sovereign country. It's under the American umbrella or protection or however you want to phrase it. But the story here is that in the former Eastern Germany, the mainstream is collapsing. The center is disappearing. And what this does is, even though a lot of these parties refuse to go into a coalition with the AFD off day, they are rendering these various governing units, polities, republics, etc., ungovernable, just like in Sweden, where the SD is the second biggest party, and you have to scramble to form coalitions uh, to govern the country and avoid them, but these coalitions become so unstable because they're formed of such wide and divergent political groupings. So a trend in Europe now is that you are experiencing a crisis in governance for the simple fact that the populists, the hard right, have come back with a vengeance. And this is all due to two things. First, 2008, the economic crisis, but even more so than that, Merkel's massive fuck-up of letting in over a million people into Germany. That is, and you have to admit it, a gift to the hard right in Europe, whereby prior to that, the level of immigration, uh, especially of non-Europeans, uh, was... I'm not going to say tolerable, it was noticeable, but you, it was somewhat tolerable. But when you had these one million plus men march into Europe, being set up everywhere, dominating the Frankfurt train station, if you've ever been there, you'll see what I mean, people were upset. And this is not going away. The impression that many mainstreamers had uh, and, and that they were themselves projecting was that these people will get used to it. People have not gotten used to it. Germany has also another situation, and it's not getting a lot of play in the press in the West, simply because they've been clamping down on a lot of the news that involves migrant violence. And even more importantly than that, there are issues within German policing, German military, and German intelligence, where you have people who are very sympathetic to the off day in positions of power. The last head of German intel, domestic, was forced out of his position because he called bullshit when there was accusations that a group of Germans in the former Eastern Germany, in Chemnitz, uh, chased down migrants when that actually wasn't the case at all. But he was forced out of his position. So, what that means is that the truth is getting distorted in favor of the narrative. Yes. And that creates an inherent contradiction in governance. Yes, this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. We must uh, continue some more about Europe when we come back. We must now take a Sexpresso break. What do you say? We take Sexpresso break. I love Sexpresso. Yes. <laughs>
Okay, very good. Uh, Caribbean Rhythms, uh, we are back with Nicolo Sello. Bap, my father has a theory on why Englishmen are so prone to the English disease, that being gay. You know what his theory is? What? His theory is very simple. It's, uh, it's one line. It's, have you ever seen their women? Yes. Yes, his problem is his problem with British women, and uh, I encourage the listeners to look up uh, Nietzsche.